Hi, this is Jody Stoddard with insights from the perspective of a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is part one of a four-part series about Daniel and Revelation. I've always been interested in the second coming since I was a kid and watched things unfold over my life, but I always knew that we had more time, that we weren't quite there yet. And then about five or six years ago, we seemed to move into an, a hastened period of time. And I started um, paying more attention, writing things down in my journal and realized that a lot of things that were happening that we were missing. So in February of 2020, I shared what I had gathered so far in a small fireside with some friends. And my daughter-in-law asked me to record it, which I did. And then I made a podcast out of that, but the podcast and the PowerPoint were separate. And so I've decided to put them together into one program. And that's the purpose of this. As you watch it, please run everything through your power of discernment and through prayer. I do use lots of scriptures and words of the prophets. But again, this is my interpretation of those things, and you need to get your own interpretation. So I hope that you enjoy. This is the second edition of the four-part video series on Daniel and Revelation, and it was reproduced on July 25th, 2020. Within a few days after producing the original videos on YouTube on April 13th, 2020, it was brought to my attention that one of the slides had been mistakenly placed in a section discussing President Nelson's talk, Ministering with the Power and Authority of God. And that incorrect slide was DNC 7711, which was supposed to go elsewhere in the video. Meanwhile, one of the scriptures he did reference was inadvertently left out. I would never purposely misquote anyone, much less a prophet of God. Um, I immediately did several things to remedy the situation while trying to figure out how to fix it. And I was able to go in and delete the slides on the incorrect scripture reference on the originals. But by that time, um, it had been copied and reposted by other people in their own YouTube groups. So I want to thank those who messaged me, um, either on YouTube or Facebook, to alert me to the error early on. And I have now published the second edition. And not only will you find the previous omitted scripture from President Nelson's footnotes and the DNC scripture placed where it should have been, but you'll also find a few tidbits of new and updated additions to the script, which I hope that you'll find enlightening. Blessings to you and your family as we continue on this last day's journey together. Fair warning, this is a Bible study to Daniel and Revelation and the end times prophecies. So if discussing the end times events or future events or prophecies scares you, then you might not want to watch this. Although um, to me, it's exciting and motivating. And it also gives me hope for the future because I know God is in charge and he knew what was coming and he told us what's coming. So knowing that, and in that light, I've tried to present these things um, as basically signs from God so that we can know that the plan is unfolding and we're part of that and that we can have peace in that journey and faith in the plan. And the Lord has told us not to fear. Isaiah 41:10, fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So as we face these future events, we can feel his love. As more and more events have been lining up, it's become like a big bag full of puzzle pieces and describing the picture that all these puzzle pieces make without the box top to show people what it, the picture looks like gets more and more difficult because there are so many pieces to this puzzle. Just like if I had you pull a puzzle piece out and it was a green one and you couldn't tell me from that piece if it was a tree or a leaf or, or a green tractor until you had more pieces to go around it and then a picture would start to form. So that is my purpose today is to take a whole lot of abstract puzzle pieces 
that when put together begin to form a picture and so that is the focus of this PowerPoint presentation is to get you to see how all these pieces begin to fit together and particularly what I'm going to focus on are temples holy days and signs in the sky and how they all correlate I really haven't gone much into the plagues or the wars at least not yet anyway but I've been amazed at how many prophecies are being fulfilled and were prophesied around temples and how important that is so that's going to be the main focus of this as we go forward biblical numbers play a huge part in knowing how to interpret the signs and if they're meaningful or not as they unfold so we're going to go through the biblical numbers that are most important quickly to give everybody an idea of what to be looking for when you're going through scriptures on the end times the biblical number seven is found over 800 times just in the bible it is the number of completeness and perfection both physical and spiritual it derives much of its meaning from being tied directly to God's creation of all things. There were seven days in a week, and the seventh day is God's Sabbath. And it took him seven days to create the earth, or six, and then he rested on the seventh. We are in the seventh millennium of time. There are seven annual holy days, and there are seven seals. Another number we're going to talk about is the number 12 realizing that we have two sets of 12 hours in each day and that when God created the universe and set it in motion he did so like a giant clock the number 12 is found 180 places in the Bible it is the symbol of faith the church and divine rule there were 12 sons of Jacob which formed the 12 tribes of Israel Jesus had 12 disciples or apostles and we have 12 today Revelation says that the kingdom of God has 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes are mentioned, and that is the 144,000. And the ancient high priest had a breastplate that had 12 stones representing the 12 tribes. So those are just a few of the number 12 shown in the Bible. 40 is a huge number in the Bible. So let's talk about the number 40. One of the biggest things we want to pay attention to about the number 40 is that it generally symbolizes a period of testing trial or probation one of the amounts of time considered to be a generation is 40 as well as 70 and 100. the gestation period of a human child is approximately 40 42 weeks it took 40 years to build the salt lake temple it rained on noah for 40 days Goliath taunted David for 40 days before he was defeated. Saul, David, and Solomon reigned for 40 years each. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus fasted in the desert for 40 days. And Jonah warned Nineveh of impending destruction for 40 days. Moses lived 40 years in the desert before God told him to go to Egypt. And then he lived in Egypt for another 40 years. He was on Mount Sinai on two different occasions for 40 days each, and the children of Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years, and he sent spies to investigate the promised land for 40 days. So those are just some of the references to the number 40 in scripture. And we want to talk about the number 70 in reference to scripture. 70 has a sacred meaning in the Bible that is made up of the factors of two perfect numbers, 7 representing perfection and 10 representing completeness and God's law. As such, it symbolizes perfect spiritual order carried out with all power. And it can also represent a period of judgment. 70 elders were appointed by Moses and we have 70s in our church. Ancient Israel spent a total number of 70 years in captivity in Babylon. Jerusalem kept 70 years of Sabbaths while Judah was in Babylonian captivity. 77s is 490 years, and they were determined for Jerusalem to complete its transgressions and make an end for sin and for everlasting righteousness to enter into it. And that's from Daniel. 
what are signs? And I hope this one gives you a chuckle. But signs are warnings. They also let us know where we are and how much further we have to go. So if you're driving down the road and you see a sign that says Los Angeles, it doesn't mean you're there yet. Next to it, you'll see a sign that tells you how many miles left you have to go. So signs tell us that we are on the right road and that we're heading in the right direction and that events are in the future are coming up. Also, we wanna make sure we keep the idea of signs separate from the actual events. For instance, after the total eclipse in 2017, I heard several people say, well, I don't get it, nothing happened. It wasn't a big deal. Because the eclipse was a sign that something was going to begin or something had been set in motion. It wasn't the event itself. So as you see signs unfold, they are pointing the way just like a road sign, a road sign would point the way or give you a warning of what was ahead. Also realize that there are multiple prophecies of Christ returning in various times and places prior to his official second coming. So we need to keep that in mind as we study. It isn't just one event. There are at least several events that we are aware of and likely more that will take place over a several year period of time. So when it talks about Christ coming in his glory, that's the time he'll be burning the earth and sanctifying and cleansing it. That's not the time when you wanna be finding out for the first time that he's back. By then you should know he is already working on the earth. Sister Wendy Nelson in a CES devotional in Hawaii in January, 2016, gave a talk called Becoming the Person You Were Born to Be. And I watched it live when she was doing it and um, it was really amazing. At nine, mark number 943, nine minutes and 43 seconds on her talk, she says this, what if you learned that the Savior had already returned to this earth, that he, as part of his second coming, had already met with some of his true followers in several mar marvelous large gatherings, gatherings about which the world, including CNN and the blogosphere, knew nothing? If you found out that the Savior was already on the earth, what would you, be des what would you desperately want to do today, and what would you be willing and ready to do tomorrow? When I heard her say that, I thought, wow, I wish I could just, you know, be her friend and call her up and ask her what she knew, because obviously there's some really big clues in there. And I also wanted to point out a few more number things. I know you probably thought we were done with the numbers, but seven years, we talked about um, the number seven being really important. And another way that that plays in is with time times and a half, which is three and a half years and 1260 days and 1290 days. And each of those is about three and a half years. And both Daniel and John in Revelation and in other prophets as well speak of two distinct periods of time, which each equal about three and a half years. And these two sets of time appear to be back to back. Time times and a half is often calculated as three and a half years, but we'll also discover some other ways that that formula can play out. The time of trouble is three and a half years, and that precedes the day of Jehovah. And this is the time when things begin to unfold. The earth begins to show the early signs of labor. And then the day of Jehovah is the second three and a half year period of time when God's judgments come upon the world in full and little of mankind remains. So that second three and a half years is when the great tribulations take place. Understanding that going forward will be really helpful. Also, some people refer to the tribulations as only three and a half years because they're only talking about the day of Jehovah. I kind of put a whole seven year umbrella over it. So when I talk about the tribulations, um, I include the, the time of troubles with the day of Jehovah for a total of seven years. The reason I do that is because it's also often referred to as a woman that travaileth and pains to be delivered. And so you have this woman in labor, and most of the time, a woman doesn't know for sure that she's in labor until she's about halfway through. And it's about that point in time when the pains begin to increase in frequency and strength, and then she knows it's time to go to the hospital. And so that's why I include both halves of that in the seven years of tribulation, because most women don't start out in hard labor. 
it starts out slow you're not even sure that it's started yet and then by the time you're about halfway through you you know that you're in labor and that's how it will be with the time of trouble versus the day of Jehovah and that second three and a half years so now we're going to look at prophecies that happen with temples and holy days and a lot of times events that are happening around surrounding temples that were prophesied in the scriptures are also happening on holy days and that's one way we can know that that is the sign we were looking for the first temple we had at the beginning of our rest the restoration was the Kirtland temple it happened at Passover on April 2nd 1836 and it fulfilled the scripture behold I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and if you study the visions that opened up when this temple was dedicated and the week this following Sunday after the dedication um, many of the ancient prophets uh, appeared there in the temple and many of the people there saw them or heard them so if you haven't studied up on that that's a really great place to start this is a great visual timeline of the 2300 days or 2300 years and as we go through you'll note that days years weeks and months can be interchangeable for different prophecies I think of it as an algebraic formula and if you plug in certain days and times and they match up with events or signs then you know that that's the ones we're looking for so we're going to look at Daniel 8 11, 14 and read those if you want to read along verse 11 yea he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifice or temple worship was taken away and the place of his sanctuary the temple was cast down and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression and it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered so this was Daniel's vision of the destruction of the second temple which happened in 70 AD there again that there's that year 70 verse 13 then I heard one saint speaking to another saint unto that certain saint which spake how long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot in other words how long until we'll have a daily sacrifice or have a temple again and he said unto me 2300 days or in this case years and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed so here you can see that um, well let me go back let's let me finish something else first Miller was the founder of the Millerites and the Seventh-day Adventists and he became convinced that the 2300 day year period started in 457 with Artaxerxes decree to rebuild Jerusalem Miller believed that the second coming would be 2300 years after that event but it wasn't the calculation takes us to 1843 to 46 AD taking into consideration that our calendar is off about three years the Nauvoo temple was the first temple where all of these ordinances were restored so was Daniel's prophecy fulfilled on April 30th 1846 we had the dedication of the Nauvoo temple and we had the daily sacrifice or temple work restored with all of the ordinances and then we jump forward to Daniel 12 verses 5 through 7 if you want to read along then I Daniel looked and behold there stood two other the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on the other side of the bank of the river and one said unto the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river how long shall it be to the end of these wonders and I heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever it shall be for time times and a half and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people all these things will be finished so I want you to think about that for a minute 
in conjunction with the dedication of the Nauvoo Temple. Knowing that the original Nauvoo Temple was the fulfillment of Daniel 8.13, what picture might Daniel have seen? Which river? Who were the two men, one on each side? Who was on the water when the question was asked, how much longer until the end, and until the power of the holy people be scattered? As I read that, I could see Joseph standing on the Nauvoo side of the river. He had been martyred two years before, but him staying there watching over the Nauvoo temple until it was decommissioned by fire. And Brigham on the other side of the river, on the west side, getting ready to lead the saints to Utah. And the answer was given time times and a half until the end of these wonders. So biblical formulas are used over and over again for different events. In this case, rather than use three and a half years, let's try plugging in a jubilee. A jubilee is seven Shemitahs. A Shemitah is seven years, so a jubilee is 49 years. And on the 49, 50th year, there's a celebration. And also, I'll show you later, a chart that shows how jubilees have marked many of the great events that have happened since the creation. So if we use a jubilee to fill in the formula, what do we get? Time equals 49 years, times would be twice that, so 98, and then half a time is 24 and a half years for a total of 171 and a half years. So if you add 171 and a half years to 1846 when the Nauvoo Temple was dedicated and the saints begin heading west, you end up in the fall of 2017. And the Revelation 12 sign of the woman of the sky happens then, as well as the first of two rare total eclipses across the United States, which are seven years apart. But before we get into that, we need to get out of the sixth seal and into the seventh. And in order to understand that, we need to talk about the seals. So we're going to do that in part number two. I'll see you there. Welcome back. This is part two of Daniel and Revelation, insights from the perspective of a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. My name is Jody Stoddard. If you missed the first one, you might want to go back and watch that one first because we kind of add line upon line so you're going to need the insight from the first one to stay up with what we're talking about now. So the background from part one had led us up to the point where we were getting ready to move into the seventh seal but before we could talk about those things we needed to get out of the sixth seal so that's what we're going to do now. According to LDS.org, Joseph Smith, Skousen, McConkie, and others believe that each seal represents a 1,000 year period in the history of the earth. Remember, it took 6,000 years or six days for God to create the world. So six days and on the seventh he rested. So we have had six seals and now we're entering the seventh seal of the millennium, which is, will be a rest time for the earth. And if this is true, we should have left the sixth seal and entered into the seventh seal around the year 2000. So let's review the things that were supposed to happen in the sixth seal before we move to the seventh seal. In Revelation 6, we read in verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Many people are still waiting for this quake before they feel we can move on. First of all, the scriptures say when the sixth seal opened. Well, that should have been about a thousand years ago. So we need to decide, was there a quake then? Yes, there was. What if we had an earthquake today that killed over a million people? Does that sound like it might qualify for what John saw in Revelation 6? What if that many people died on just the continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe alone? with more unrecorded deaths taking place on the other four yet undiscovered continents that were similar in magnitude. Would that qualify? 
What if over a million people would have died when the world's population was much smaller than it is today? That million people would have made an even greater impact on humanity then than if it happened today, right? But can you even imagine a million people dying in an earthquake today? Well, in 1202 AD, which according to Joseph Smith would have been in the sixth seal, there was such an earthquake. It killed 1.1 million people. Keep in mind that this was when the total population for the three record-keeping continents, which documented the effects of this quake, was a mere 370 million people, compared with the population of those same three continents today of 6.3 billion people, or 17 times more population now than then. So it stands to reason that the impact on humanity of a quake of that magnitude today if it were to only affect those three continents, would have killed 18.7 million people. I share the comparison to show that 1.1 million dying in a quake in 1202 was much more catastrophic than one might have comprehended at first glance. But even to comprehend a quake that would take out a million people is hard to wrap one's mind around. In order to recognize the magnitude of that staggering number, let's look at the history of earthquakes. According to Wikipedia, the earthquake history was limited prior to Christ, but there are records beginning after Christ. In that first thousand years AD, guesstimates show that around 900,000 or less than a million people died in earthquakes over that 1,000 year period, which would have been considered the fifth seal. As we move into the second thousand years or sixth seal between 1,000 to 2,000 AD, we see a huge increase in just the first 200 years where one and a half million people die in quakes. All in all, a f estimated five million people died of earthquakes in the sixth seal. In fact, the quakes had become so frequent between 1132 AD to 1202 AD that people had taken to living in caves because they were tired of their houses falling down on their heads. In Revelation 6.15 we read, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens in the rocks of the mountains. There will be more earthquakes, large ones. There's one that's prophesied in Revelation 8, which would be in the seventh seal. And there's more after that. But as for the one prophesied to happen in the beginning of the sixth seal, it did happen in 1202 AD. So there are some more prophecies that were to take place in the sixth seal. Let's discover what those were. Revelation 7 1 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel, Elias, ascending from the east having the seal of the living, living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So here again we have references to temples and their importance in the sealing ordinances and, they, and the protection that they offer the saints. This is a good time to remember too how it was said that the saints needed the sealing ordinances of the Nauvoo Temple prior to their heading west in order to have the strength and protection to survive. To add additional testimony to that of Elias and his saying that the saints needed to be sealed prior to devastation taking place, up through the year 1999, we had 68 operating temples around the world. And then an astounding thing happened in the year 2000. We dedicated 34 more temples. In just one year, we built half again as many temples as it took us 170 years to build. There's one of these temples in particular that is described in Revelation 7. Before we talk about and discover what that is, let me give you a little background. A few weeks after a certain temple was dedicated early in 2000, my husband and our ward missionaries at the time attended a large Northwest regional leadership training. Afterwards, the missionaries came back and they came over to my house and shared something with me. They said that a 70 had told them that the seventh seal was opened and that the temple dedication was a catalyst. And I thought, if that's true, I should be able to find it in the scriptures. In reading Joel chapter 1, I found these verses. 14. Sanctify ye fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land 
into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. I thought, okay, that's calling for what sounds like a temple dedication, house of the Lord, solemn assembly. But I thought, is there anything else I can find? Then in Revelation 7, I found this, starting in verse 9. And after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and tongues and people stood before the throne and before the Lord, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders, and the four beasts and fell, fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And there it was, a great multitude, all of the inhabitants. Can you think of an event that fulfilled these scriptures? April 6, 2000 was the dedication of the Palmyra Temple and was the first and only one of two to date that were televised dedications to the masses where all members over the age of 12 could attend a temple dedication. They did so through their stake centers with a recommend in hand and all the doors were locked 10 minutes prior to the beginning. Palmyra was televised to the US and Canada and two years later Nauvoo was televised worldwide other than those and localized regional dedications, there hasn't been one since that was to the masses, to large groups of people. Why does it sound like a temple dedication? It says they are clothed in white robes. The throne of God refers to a temple. They have palms in their hands and all members were requested to bring white hankies to represent the palms thrown down before the Lord on his triumphant entry. To Jerusalem. Those hankies were used for the Hosanna shout, as mentioned in verse 10. In verse 12 is a prayer. It begins and ends with Amen. Also note that the Conference Center was dedicated in the year 2000 and was televised worldwide and also included a Hosanna shout. April 6, 2000 was also the 170th anniversary of the restoration. So I had my answer. The Palmyra Temple dedication, as described in Revelation 7 and in Joel, was a catalyst for something to happen. So let's see what it is that happened. Since the initial production of this series, and in consideration of some recent events, I have come to see that while Joel led me to the previous verses in Revelation 7 concerning the opening of the seventh seal, these verses in Joel may actually have been part of something we just witnessed. Joel 1:14, Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land, into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. After the April 2020 General Conference, many people took a new view of these scriptures. We, along with the entire watching world, and after a recent fast, which President Nelson had called for, participated in a solemn assembly, which included the Hosanna shout, which was done during conference. If that is true, then it gives even more meaning to the next scripture in Joel 1, verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Interestingly, Isaiah speaks of two periods of time, three and a half years each. The first part of that is known as a time of troubles. And the second half, or the second three and a half years of the seven, is called the Day of Jehovah. So there you see it again. Alas, for the Day of the Lord, or the Day of Jehovah, is at hand. So are we getting ready to enter the second half of the Great Tribulations? When you read 
the next chapter, Revelation 8, 1, it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. So that is the half hour question. At the time, I thought this might be referring to the moment of silence that President Hinckley called for during the dedication. And I thought that for about 15 years until I decided to do the math and compare it by comparing one of God's days to ours. And here's the math. A half hour of God's time equals about 20.83 years or about the space of 20 to 20 years on earth. Later, after I did the math, I realized others had done it too, but it was kind of fun to figure it out on my own. <laughs> so 21 years also represents three sets of seven, which might be significant. So now we find ourselves in the seventh seal. In President Nelson's talk, Ministering with the Power and Authority of God, in his footnote number three, he shares the following scriptures. But first he says this, I fear that too many of our brothers and sisters do not grasp the privileges that could be theirs. Then footnote number three takes us to these scriptures where we can find out what he means by that. The very first scripture that he shares in footnote number three is from Doctrine and Covenants 84 verses 19 through 22. And this greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom even the key of the knowledge of God. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. So if we look back at that, it's saying that if we have the priesthood and the ordinances, we can see the face of God, even the Father, and live while we are still in the flesh. And I want to reinforce again, remember, these are footnotes, scriptures, after his comment, I fear that too many of our brothers and sisters do not grasp the privileges that could be theirs. Now we are taken to Doctrine and Covenants 107.19. To have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to have the heavens opened unto them, to commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn, and to enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. To me, that infers we can achieve that in this life. Just a note of interest, those two former Doctrine and Covenants sections, 107 and 84, um, he used in this talk, and then a year later, those are the two of the three sections that he encouraged the sisters to go read the entire sections of. So he is reiterating the importance of what is in those two sections. And then we go on in the last scripture that he references in footnote number three, and if you um, open this up on your gospel app and then um, click on the little three, then it's going to automatically load the two scriptures uh, from Doctrine and Covenants. But at the very top, you'll see that he also references these scriptures and then you have to go find them. Um, but he, this is part of what he references. Joseph Smith, Genesis, Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 1430. For God, having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself, that everyone being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up the waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from before the foundation of the world. That's the end of his footnote number three, but let's continue reading to put those two verses into perspective and context. 
verse 32, and men having this faith coming up unto this order of God, what happens to them? They were translated and taken up into heaven. Now Melchizedek was a priest of this order, and his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven and sought for the city of Enoch, which God had before taken, separating it from the earth, having reserved it unto the latter days or the end of the world, and hath said and sworn with an oath that the heavens and the earth should come together and the sons of God should be tried so as by fire. So there's a lot in those verses. Some of them reference the other two scriptures he's shared from Doctrine and Covenants. But this order that he is speaking of is the Melchizedek High Priest Order of God where people are translated, as was the city of Enoch. So let's do a recap of the privileges President Nelson says we are not accessing. We can receive the mysteries of heaven, have the heavens opened, be part of the church of the firstborn, which includes having our calling and election made sure, enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus Christ, and that would be a second comforter experience, translation into a terrestrial being, which is not the same as a resurrected being. According to Joseph, it's being part of the terrestrial order, which the city of Enoch was, and we can interact with them, and they are ministering angels to this earth. So that's a recap of his talk, just that one footnote. And so then we're gonna go on and maybe go a little more into depth on some of the things he was talking about, or maybe those are new things for you, you haven't heard them before, so we will touch lightly on some of those. But back in the sixth seal, John did introduce us to the 144,000. In Revelation 13 we read, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. Several apostles and prophets have said that this is referring to those John saw, who were foreordained in the preexistence to become the 144,000 during the tribulations. And John was not saying at this point that the tribulations are over. Remember, we are just getting ready here in these verses to enter the seventh seal. So it's obvious that the tribulations have not even begun yet at this point in his visions. While I have more information regarding the 144,000, suffice it to say that this is a symbolic number representing 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes, but it is in no way a fixed number. It is actually more of a title than a number. Just as it was in the days of Enoch after his city was taken up, they continued to come down as ministering angels and preach to those willing to listen. And as those people qualified, they were also taken up. Enoch's people did this prior to the flood, which represents baptism. We will repeat this pattern prior to the fire or sanctification of the earth. Let's stop for a moment and remember what we know about the millennium. The earth will be changed to what? A terrestrial one. And what will happen to the people left on the earth during the millennium? They will become translated, terrestrial individuals. Remember, that's different than resurrected terrestrial beings. The 144,000 are the vanguard group, the first ones, the first fruits, his elect, those that will be changed first in order to help those during the tribulations. Are we part of that group? How can we know? Doctrine and Covenants 7711. What are we to understand by the sealing the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of every tribe? Answer. We are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel, for they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people 
by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn those angels are likely from the city of enoch ministering angels that will come down and take care of that let's consider a few things about translation translation is not a get out of the tribulation free card it is a position of service so desiring that would be a worthy cause two besides all of those who we know were translated and there are likely many that we are not aware of an entire city was translated and then they continued to pull more up into the city after that and they were called Zion and we are supposed to become Zion we have already been invited to participate in the same in our day there are clues to this in third Nephi chapter 28 there's a big clue here verse 4 and when he had spoken unto them he turned himself unto the three and he said unto them what will ye that I should do unto you when I am gone unto the Father? And they sorrowed in their hearts, for they durst not speak unto him the thing which they desired. And he said unto them, Behold, I know your thoughts, and ye have desired the thing which John, my beloved, who was with me in my ministry, before that I was lifted up by the Jews, desired of me. What's the big clue? They desired it and they asked for it with their hearts and the Lord gave it to them and if you want to go and read the rest of third Nephi 28 there are some amazing differences in there between what the nine were blessed with versus what the three were blessed with that um, we miss all the time so I would encourage you to go and read that with prayer more in depth all right, let's talk about the chronology of the book of Revelation. According to LDS.org and other sources, if you remember, each seal represents a thousand years. The book of Revelation is in chronological order through chapter 7. That takes you through the end of the sixth seal. Then from Revelation 8 on, the seventh seal opens, and John is all over the place. It's like explaining an action-packed movie to a friend especially one that begins in the middle and then has flashbacks and you jump forward. And he also sees many things that overlap. It helps to remember this when reading the last part of Revelation. All right, one of the ways we can know we're in the seventh seal is that some of the events of the seventh seal have started to happen. Earlier I touched on the sign of the Revelation 12, Woman in the Sky. So we're gonna discuss that right now and how this was set into motion. And again, this is a sign that events have been set into motion. Revelation 12, 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. So in November of 2016, Jupiter, which is known as the king planet moved into the midsection of Virgo where it stayed there in retrograde motion for 42 weeks the gestation period of a human child when Jupiter left Virgo on September 23rd 2017 it was the eve of Rosh Hashanah remember we talked about how holy days and signs when they align uh, is another way to know if that's the sign or event that we're looking for. As Jupiter exited Virgo, for the first time in 7,000 years, these stars were all aligned. The sun was at her shoulder, the moon was at her feet, and there was a crown of 12 stars at her head. Constellation Leo, which has nine stars, and Mercury, Mars, and Venus pretty amazing right and NASA has a program and there's several other star constellation programs out there where you can go in and plug in any date in the future or in the past 
and know exactly where the stars were in the sky or will where they will be. So let's decipher what this means. According to LDS.org, the woman is the church. The crown of 12 stars are the apostles. The man-child is the kingdom of God on the earth, which includes the 144,000 and those charged with building the new Jerusalem. Revelation 12:5 says, And she brought forth a man-child, which is the kingdom of God on the earth, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And that is direct revelation with Christ, which suggests that the 144,000 and those in the New Jerusalem will communicate directly with him. And her child was caught up unto God, unto his throne. And that's a reference to the 144,000, where they are taken up and translated into terrestrial beings. And the woman, which is the church, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days, which is three and a half years, or the first part of the tribulation, which is known as the time of trouble. The second three and a half years is referenced later in Revelation 12 as it speaks of the remnant of the woman or the church who have a testimony, but who had not yet been translated. This appears to be those who are protected during the day of Jehovah or during the great tribulation. Again, this was a sign that things have been set into motion. More puzzle pieces to consider. In 1948, Israel became a nation. Keeping in mind that scriptures have layered and multiple meanings, let's consider what Daniel says in 924. Seventy weeks or years are determined upon thy people and thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now this event took place at the destruction of the second temple in Jesus's time and Daniel had foreseen that prophecy happening. But here we can use that same prophecy again. 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks or 69 years. So if we use that 70th year of Israel becoming a nation, what can we see? When you add 70 years to 1948, you end up in 2018. And then Daniel references the 69th year as well, so we'll look at that in a minute. But 70 years after Israel became a nation, on the very anniversary day of May 14, 2018, we moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. 70 years to the day. So again, you end up in 2018, 70 years later. So we know that that was important and an event that means something. Daniel also told us to watch for the 69th year too. So let's see what happened in 2017. In August 2017, a total eclipse took place across the United States. This was a rare event. Sometimes they'll happen over the edge of a country or out in the middle of the ocean is usually where they take place. But this one crossed over the United States completely. And immediately following this eclipse came three witnesses in the form of the three record-breaking costliest hurricanes in U.S. history. One of them was named Jose, aka Joseph, and the other one was named Maria, also known as Mary. So you have the eclipse, two, and then you have two hurricanes named Mary and Joseph moving in onto the U.S. continent, and then you have the sign of Revelation 12, which is the Virgin, or Mary, giving birth to a child. Also, 2017 was the 70th Jubilee since the Exodus from Egypt. 
And remember, a jubilee is seven Shemitahs of seven years each, the 49th, 50th year being the jubilee. And here on this incredible timeline, we can see how jubilees have played a really important role since creation, or at least since Adam and Eve left the garden, since we're not sure how long they were in the garden. But you can see that the first 2,000 years, there were 40 jubilees. And on the 40th jubilee, Abraham was born and Noah died. Then 500 years more pass, and we have the 50th jubilee. And that was when the exodus took place. And then another 500 years, and we have the 60th jubilee, and the first temple was complete. 500 more years is the 70th jubilee, and that was the decree to restore Jerusalem. Another 500 years pass, and you have the 80th jubilee, which is when Christ was born, his first coming. And then we have a mirrored version on the other end here, 2,000 years on each end. And so we're now in the 120th jubilee which is when Christ, his reign begins. And this is the end of part two of four videos on Daniel and Revelation. But it just keeps getting more exciting in the next two videos. So I hope you'll join us there. See you soon. Welcome back. This is part three of four on Daniel and Revelation. This is Jody Stoddard, and these are insights from the perspective of a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. If you haven't watched part one and two, you're going to want to do that because we're building on things we already know. It's like we're building a giant jigsaw puzzle, and you need the pieces from those first two videos before you'll understand moving forward. But welcome, and we hope you enjoy this. All right, we're going to start this video out talking about the two eclipses. We discussed the first one that happened in August of 2017 a little bit already. I want to go into some more detail on these and why they're significant. Um, remember that these eclipses, there'll be another one in 2024, so they're about seven years apart. And remember that Daniel and Revelation speak of two sets of three and a half years each, uh, which would be a total of seven years. So remember that as we study this out. Um, interesting, this first eclipse that crossed over in 2017, crossed over seven cities or towns named Salem. Remember Melchizedek was from Salem. Salem was the name of a large city prior to the flood that was on the American continent. So when the waters receded and people spread out again, then they named in the old, in the well we say the old world, but to them it was the new world. Um, in the Middle East, when they came upon a city, they named it Jerusalem which means New Salem. And they also had rivers there that they named after the rivers from where they had initially started out from. So the name Salem means to be complete or whole, which was the same meaning that the number seven has, also means complete, finished. In 2024, there'll be the second total wear eclipse seven years after the first one, and that one will make an X over the heartland of America. It will come from the other side and cross over right at the heartland. Let's look at another map. It'll give you a little closer view of where it will intersect. So here is the closer up view. You can see up here is St. Louis, so it's close to Missouri. Part of it's over Missouri. And what you do want to realize is that it is a little south of where Adam on Diamond and the New Jerusalem, Jackson County, Missouri is supposed to be. However, this does also run close to the New Madrid Fault. And we are expecting some more earthquakes that happen in the seventh seal. So if that quake happens, then it before the eclipses it would substantially or could substantially move the earth enough to change where the intersection of the eclipse happens. All right, we've talked a lot about numbers and in Matthew 18:22 there is a scripture 
that says, it's talking, uh, Peter is asking the Lord how often he should forgive. Usually we attribute Christ's comment to that of a metaphor. Forgive 70 times 7. In other words, don't stop forgiving. But I've always felt, as it is with most scriptures, that there's a deeper meaning that we should be searching for. One of the promptings the Spirit led me to consider is a mathematical one having to do with the symbolism of 70 times 7. So we know that the biblical number 7 means finished, complete, and or eventually perfected. So this should give us a couple of new ideas to consider. One, that we should forgive, especially ourselves, and keep trying until we eventually get it right. In April 2018 General Conference, Elder Lynn G. Robinson references this concept in his talk entitled Until 70 Times 7. His premise is that a loving God and Jesus will continue to give us chances, the ultimate goal being our eternal perfection and exaltation. Another meaning could be construed as being until someone or something is complete, finished, or done, like the Lord's work on the earth. With the second concept in mind, what would it look like if we considered that Christ might have been saying to Peter, Continue to forgive until the end, until the seventh period of time, until I come again. That is the concept that the Spirit has been leading me to consider for a couple of years now. And I've continued to seek for understanding mathematically as I have felt there's something there. Then we moved into 2018, into the 70th year since Israel became a nation, and there were 70 jubilees since the Exodus. And as I was typing all of this up into my journal, it suddenly all became perfectly clear. There were 70 years or jubilees, and Israel was a nation for 70 years prior to the first eclipse. Then we have seven years pass, making an X over the middle of the heartland of America, and that seven years during between the two eclipses suddenly made a picture it's right there 70 times 7 the earth will be complete or finished and ready to begin a new chapter now there may still be things that don't get completed in this seven year period remember this is the tribulation time and then things still might need to happen after that if everything doesn't get finished but I think that this is definitely a sign and another meaning of the phrase 70 times 7. It's also interesting to realize the Hebrew words for certain things. The word for sign was ot, and it was also the word for letter in Hebrew, because letters are often form the form of a sign. They signify something and point to a meaning, just as how in English we might say X marks the spot or use an X as a marker or indicator, so the Hebrew letter Tav or Ta was used in a similar way. The Tav is a letter that can also be used as a sign, just like our X. The Hebrew alphabet has evolved over the centuries, but back in the time of David and Solomon, the letter Tav actually used to be drawn as an X. Israel has minted a commemorative temple coin. And before I let you take a look at that, I want to explain what a temple coin is. It was needed anciently to offer as a token by the men who attended the temple. This is why there were so many money changers outside the temple. You could not pay a tribute to God with a Roman coin, so it needed to be changed into a temple coin. If you didn't have a Roman coin, you could bring an animal or even doves or something to exchange for a temple coin. The moving of our U.S. Embassy in May of 2018 was so significant in recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel that the Jewish people minted a commemorative temple coin, and it's being used as a fundraiser for their temple, but also to honor President Trump. In the book of Ezra, we see that King Cyrus, though not a Hebrew or Jew, was very instrumental in getting their second temple built. And the coin is embossed with the head of President Trump and King Cyrus, and it reads, and he charged me to build him a temple in Jerusalem, build him a house in Jerusalem. That's from Ezra 1-2. It also mentions on the coin 70 years to fulfill Daniel's promise. So I think it's pretty amazing. Not a coincidence. 
Now we're going to spend some more time working with the number 40, and particularly how Jewish holy days and the number 40 have lined up in the significance of the following. So the fall Jewish holy days are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The first high holy day is the Jewish New Year, and it's usually mid to late September. And it's a day of shouting or blasting of trumps, and it's the sounding of the ram's horn or shofar. And it's also um, when the king will be born. And Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, is a time for fasting, prayer, asking forgiveness. It's the Sabbath of Sabbaths. It begins 163 days after Passover, so it changes every year, the day that it falls on. And it's the culmination of the Days of Awe, which began at Rosh Hashanah, in which one should have repented or it is believed that they will have to atone for their own sins. Okay, now remember, the sign of the woman in the sky happened on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, September 23rd, 2017. So that's when the sign of the woman of the sky was given. And being on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, that's also the day that God is proclaimed king. Seven days later, in 2017, was Yom Kippur Day of Atonement, Friday night, September 29th through Saturday, September 30th. If you count backwards 40 days from Yom Kippur, it was the first eclipse in August. Yom Kippur again signifies a time for repentance. So this was a warning. From that first eclipse, we had 40 days as a warning, a final warning to the nation or the nations of the earth, but particularly our nation, to repent or we would have to atone for our own sins. This talk is filled with the number 40 and it was given in April of 1981 as a BYU speech from Ezra Taft Benson. It's called Prepare Yourselves for the Great Day of the Lord. If you have not listened to this, you need to go find it and listen to it. It is powerful. My brother was in attendance at this devotional and I remember him coming home and telling us about it and basically saying that he felt that they were told that they would be alive to usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And at the end of the fourth segment of this video series, I will give you a modern day quote from a prophet that happened just at our last conference from an apostle who said basically the same thing. So let's check out this talk by then Elder Ezra Taft Benson. He begins by saying, during the last week of our Lord's mortal life, he was privately approached on the Mount of Olives by his disciples and they asked him two questions. The first of which was, tell us when these shall these things be which thou hast said concerning the destruction of the temple and the Jews. And that's from Matthew 24, 4. And for the base of a, basis of their earnest inquiry was a prophecy of Jesus that had left even the disciples stunned. While standing in the temple precincts, Jesus had declared, There shall not be left here upon this temple one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And then Elder Benson goes on to say, Saints of Zion, do you realize we are living in the days of the fulfillment of these signs and wonders? You are among those who will see many of these prophecies fulfilled. Just as certain as was the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem and the scattering of the Jews, so shall these words of the Savior be certain to your generation. It was 40 years from when Christ answered the disciples question about the signs of the end until the temple was thrown down, until it was actually thrown down. Elder Benson goes on, you will live in the midst of economic and political and spiritual instability. When you see these signs, unmistakable evidences that his coming is nigh, be not troubled, but stand in holy places and be not moved until the day of the Lord come. Holy men and women stand in holy places, and these places include our temples, chapels, homes, and the stakes of Zion, which are, as the Lord declares, for a defense and a refuge from the storm and from wrath, when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. So there he's talking about the tribulations. And he goes on. 
Will you be among those who are faithful to the end? Will you endure? Are you prepared? Can you live in the world and not partake of the sins of the world? Will you arise and shine forth as the Lord has commanded? Will you be a light and a standard for the nations? We know you can. We pray you will. We have every confidence that you, the rising generation, will not falter. I repeat, you are the valiant spirits reserved for this exceptional time. Make the choice. Rise to the task of this momentous hour. End quote. Here he references the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem as being 40 years, showing us that by generation, in this talk, he means 40 years. Quote, we have every confidence that you, the rising generation, will not falter, I repeat. You are valiant spirits reserved for this exceptional time. Make the choice. Rise to the task of this momentous hour. Half an hour is just over 20 years, so an hour would be 40 years. Just as certain as was the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem, 40 years, and the scattering of the Jews, so shall these words of the Savior be certain to your generation, end quote. Can there be any question that he was giving us a prophetic time, just as did Daniel and John the Revelator? And when was this talk given? April 1981. When you add 40 years to that, you end up at the halfway point between the two, three and a half year sections of the tribulations. So you end up in the spring of 2021. All right, we're going to change gears a little bit and we're going to talk about the tribe of Levi and their importance in these winding up scenes. Joshua 18:7 says, but the Levites have no part among you, meaning land, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. Deut Deuteronomy 18, 1 and 2, the priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor land inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no land inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he hath said unto them. So here we see that they were given the Aaronic priesthood as an inheritance upon their heads forever. They were not given a land inheritance, as were the other tribes. And Joseph Smith reiterated this in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 319. The Levitical priesthood is forever hereditary, fixed on the head of Aaron's and his sons forever. What was the role of the tribe of Levi? Their work was ministering in the sanctuary. They are sometimes spoken of as distinct from the priests, but some of times also as priests. The work of the Levites was to assist the priests and they slaughtered the sacrifices and generally assisted in the temple. The Levites were themselves offered as a wave offering on behalf of the children of Israel. They thus became God's peculiar property, given to him in place of the firstborn. They were cleansed for their office. They had no land inheritance, but they had the tithe and a claim on the alms of the people at feast times. The Levitical priesthood is part of the Aaronic priesthood, and it holds the keys to the ministering of angels. Doctrine and Covenants 84.25 says, Therefore he took Moses out of their midst, and the holy Melchizedek priesthood also. And the lesser priesthood continued, which priesthood holdeth the keys of the ministering of angels and the preparatory gospel. Cleon Skousen went to Jerusalem years ago and helped them plan their temple. And these are his words. And when he says fourth temple, he's counting the tabernacle that traveled with him uh, in the desert, in the wilderness also. So um, this will be the third stone temple that they will have built. He says the fourth temple in Jerusalem will be copied after the earlier temples of the Jews and will therefore be designed for blood sacrifices. However, once the Jews have learned that their Messiah has come, the purpose of those blood sacrifices in anticipation of Christ's sacrifice will give them a new perspective. Nevertheless, Joseph Smith indicated that the law of the sacrifice will be continued as part of the restitution of all things 
until the sons of Levi have learned how to offer these sacrifices in righteousness. I add my opinion to that of the tribe, to that of uh, Cleon Skousens, that the tribe of Levi will be the ones responsible for building their own temple. I have been following their preparations now on templeinstitute.org. They have awakened after a 2000 year slumber and realized that they need to get this temple built. They realize they're responsible to restore these ancient rites and are actively seeking to do that. Now, hearing that blood sacrifices will be restored might have a few of you confused. So let me read the following. This is from LDS.org. The prophet Malachi prophesied that in the latter days, the sons of Levi would offer an offering unto the Lord again. John the Baptist reaffirmed this divine appointment at the time of the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood. This brief sacrifice of practice of blood sacrifice in the latter days was explained by Joseph Smith as being part of an essential a part of the restoration of all things of formal, former gospel dispensations. He said, quote, it is generally supposed that sacrifice was entirely done away when the great sacrifice, i.e. the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus was offered up and that there will be no more necessity for the ordinance of sacrifice in the future. But those who assert this are certainly not acquainted with duties, privileges, and authority of the priesthood or with the prophets. These sacrifices, as well as every ordinance belonging to the priesthood, will, when the temple of the Lord shall be built and the sons of Levi purified, be fully restored and attended to in all their powers, ramifications, and blessings. This ever did and ever will exist when the powers of the Melchizedek priesthood are sufficiently manifest. Else how can the restitution of all things spoken of by the holy prophets be brought, brought to pass? It is not to be understood that the law of Moses will be established again with all its rites and variety of ceremonies. This has never been spoken of by the prophets. But those things which existed prior to Moses' day, namely sacrifice, will be continued." End quote. And in Doctrine and Covenants we read in 13 verse 1, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, and this shall never be taken again from the earth, until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. And I believe that after their offering is again acceptable unto the Lord, they will then be taught the gospel and move forward from there. That at that point in time, the priesthood, which has been hereditary, once they offer in righteousness again and it's accepted of the Lord, then that priesthood will become fully effective again. And from there, they will move forward and learn the gospel and then get the higher priesthood and the higher temple rites. So where was the ancient temple really? Because there's talk that the ancient temple actually is in what's known as the city of David. So here you have the wall and here you have the Dome of the Rock. And then down these stairs is the city of David. So just outside the wall of Jerusalem. And right now they are excavating what appears to be a temple underneath the, the bottom part of what's left of a temple, which includes a small natural spring. The Savior said that no stone would be left upon another when the city was destroyed. So these are the underground parts of what appears to have been an ancient temple. This is an aerial photo. It says the city of David archaeological site, the real ancient Jerusalem. Ancient place of worship found near Jerusalem challenges assumptions about the last temple. It's at least the same size as Solomon's temple and resembling that structure's description in the Bible. The Gion Springs, which fills the pool of Shilom, Siloam, runs near the temple, which would fulfill the prophecy of a spring beneath the temple and have been used for the required animal sacrifices. And I found this picture to be interesting, and it says, Mysterious carvings beneath the city of David leaves Israeli archaeological archaeologists baffled. So these are the Kohanim. They are the ancestors of the ancient Levite bloodline. They've kept this bloodline pure for 2000 years. 
And over the last decade or a little less, they've been training in the ancient rites of temple sacrifices. So after 2,000 years of not, the last 7, 8, 9, 10 years, they have been training in that again. They built an altar, and in December of 2018, they dedicated their altar and invited 70 nations. There's that number 70 again. They offered a wheat offering. That is also significant. And in December 2018, or January 2019, we saw significant changes in our own temple worship. So again, those are more things that happened in 2018 when Daniel said they would. In Ezra chapter 3, you can read that prior to the previous temple being built, they built an altar and offered sacrifice two years and two months prior to the foundation stone being laid on their new temple. If history is repeating itself, that would mean that their next temple would begin being built in the middle of 2021 which would be about the end of half hour of silence, smack dab in the middle of the two eclipses, and halfway through the seven year tribulation. President Uchtdorf in his April 2019 talk said that it took Paul 40 days to walk from Jerusalem to Rome. So there's the number 40 again. So when he said that, my ears perked up. And so I decided to try and see where that fit in. When you add 40 days to the Rome Temple dedication of March 10th, 2019, you end up at Passover, which was April 22nd, 2019. And that was the first real complete Passover in 2000 years. They did a blood sacrifice, not on the Temple Mount, but they did a blood sacrifice on Passover, April 22nd, 2019 which was exactly 40 days after we dedicated the Rome Temple. This picture and quote that I'm going to read is from israeltoday.co.il from April of 2019. Quote, in elaborate ceremony overlooking Temple Mount, group of Jewish priests fulfill biblical commandment for Passover. In accordance with the biblical commandment, priests from the Temple Institute sacrificed a Passover lamb this year overlooking the Temple Mount in the ancient city of Jerusalem. During the Temple times, the focus of Jewish holiday of Passover was a sacrificial lamb. Every family large enough to consume a young lamb or goat was required to make an offering at the Jewish Temple. Today, in the absence of the Temple, the commandment to offer the Passover sacrifice is memorialized in the form of a shank, uh, roasted shank bone placed over the Passover cedar plate. The Temple Institute is dedicated to rebuilding the Temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem and its ceremonies in accordance with the Biblical commandment. The Jerusalem-based group are pre preparing every aspect of Temple worship and restoring the central role it fulfilled in the spiritual well-being of both Israel and all the nations of the world, according to the group's mandate." End quote. So again, they're working to have that happen on the Temple Mount. So we have this group that believes that the temple should be on the Temple Mount and then the other group of archaeologists that's uncovering this other temple that looks like it might have actually been the second temple. So we have that that's being worked out. Also 2020 they had gotten permission to do a blood sacrifice on the Temple Mount and then COVID-19 hit. They had written a letter to Benjamin Netanyahu a couple of days prior to Passover of 2020 and I'm not sure if they got permission to do that or not. I haven't found anything where it says that they actually did that. But again if they did this would be the second time in a year, so a year ago Passover and then this year and if we are following history then the two years and two months would be up in the spring of next year. Meanwhile everything is ready for their temple. You can go on templeinstitute.org and you can even take a virtual tour on there of the temple. The robes are made. They've recreated the breastplate with the 12 gemstones. Um, even the blue dye that's used in the tassels used to come from a shellfish that was thought to be extinct for the past 2,000 years. And a few years ago they found those shellfish again, so even the dye is authentic. Here you see the menorah 
it's finished and also the shoe bread trays and then if you go like I said to templeinstitute.org you can see all of the vessels and the various um, things that they need for the temple rites to restore those ancient rites they have all of it ready Hey, another prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled is the prophecy of the red heifer. After the children of Israel left Egypt and camped at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses went up for the law. When he came down, he found them worshiping the golden calf. So he broke that higher law because obviously they weren't ready for it. And um, the Lord was angry and told them that they needed to atone for that and that he would provide a red heifer. They needed to go find it and it would be offered as a burnt offering to atone for the sins of their golden calf worship. Since then there have been a total of nine perfect red heifers which have been sacrificed up until the time of Christ. There will be a total of ten. So their prophecy says that the Messiah will sacrifice the tenth heifer at the base of the Mount of Olives. Numbers 19 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein there is no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer. It is a purification for sin. So this heifer must be 100% perfectly red. It represents the Messiah. Nine have been sacrificed since Moses up to the time Christ was born. And then the tenth will be sacrificed by the Messiah when he comes, which for them will be the first time. But for us, we know it's the second coming. The Jews are raising at least one perfect red heifer. It must be the age of three, which this one will be in the fall of 2021. So again, there we are in that middle time period between the two eclipses and the end of the half hour silence. It all happens kind of right in there. All right, that caught you up with what the Jews are doing right now. So let's get back to uh, Revelation. In the middle of 19, there's another temple dedication there. Not quite as obvious as the one in Revelation 7, but it is a temple dedication. So let's see what that's all about. Okay, so follow along Revelation 19, 1 through 9. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying alleluia salvation and glory and honor and power unto the lord our god for true and righteous are his judgments for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand and again they said alleluia and her smoke and prayers rose up for ever and ever and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped god that sat on the throne which represents the temple saying amen alleluia so there we see that some kind of event happened where God had avenged the, um, the blood of his saints at her hands. So it sounds like something happened that would have caused him, for, you know, a forgiveness of some sort there. Um, and a voice came out of the throne saying, praise God, all ye his servants and ye that fear him, both great and small. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying alleluia for the lord god omnipotent reigneth let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints so think of white temple clothing there and he said unto me right blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. So let's quickly review. There was prayer and praise. The balancing of the scales with good. Sounds like something happened where um, a restitution was made and forgiveness was given for those uh, who, what does it say, the, the blood of the saints. There was restitution made for that. There were prayers. 24 elders and four beasts the throne is the temple great multitude and they gave the hosanna shout the bridegroom cometh arrayed in white linen and blessed are those called to the marriage of the lamb
All right, so what temple would that have been? What city would that have been who had to atone for the blood of the saints? If you read Revelation 18 and even quickly skim through that, I think pretty quickly you'll realize what city it is. We'll read the last verse, Revelation 18:24, And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all those that were slain upon the earth. So here I think we can pretty much be assured that the city we're speaking of is Rome. When the apostles were there, Elder Bednar and Rasband went to the prison and they did a video on this. You can look it up on LDS.org. Um, they went to the prison that housed Peter and Paul. And so there again, those are the prophets that were slain and all the saints that were slain at that time. In fact, when you mention the item Roman candle, we typically think of a fireworks, a firecracker that you put in a bottle. However, that came from Rome where baskets were hanging on the sides of the buildings where they would put their rubbish in and burn it. So that gave light to the streets and, um, you know, and then they could get rid of their extra rubbish or whatever. Well, they started putting Christians in there. So the Christians became known as Roman candles and they would light them on fire. So I know that's horrific, but that's where that term comes from. So when you're talking about blood of the saints and the city responsible for that, it was Rome. So who were the four and 20 and the four beasts? Revelation 19.4 said, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped the God that sat on the throne. So let's count how many people are in this picture. First of all, we have the ancient twelve in statue at the back of the picture. Then, all dressed in fine white linen, which is the righteousness, we have six apostles at the front on that side and six on the other side for 12. So now we have 24. And then we have the first presidency, three of them, and Jesus Christ. So we have the 20 and four elders and the four beasts. When you go to the scriptures and click on the footnote for four beasts, the topical guide takes you to an entry for cherubim. And here is the Bible dictionary for cherubim. Figures representing heavenly creatures, the exact form being unknown, they are found in the Holy of Holies and on the mercy seat of the Ark, and in the visions of Ezekiel. In the account of the fall, cherubim are represented as keeping the way of the tree of life. Temple work is a work of exaltation. The tree of life is a work of exaltation. This photograph depicts 24 apostles and three prophets and Jesus Christ. Temples are portals or gateways to the throne of God. God has always placed cherubim to keep and guard these sacred gateways. Consider this verse in that light. 2 Nephi 9, 41. And then, my beloved brethren, come unto the Lord, the Holy One. Remember that his paths are righteous. Behold, the way for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course before him. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel. And he employeth no servant there, and there is none other way, save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. So Jesus Christ is the ultimate or chief cherubim or guardian of the gateway to the throne of God. And the first presidency are the holders of those keys and responsible today for those keys on the earth. They are to watch over and guard and see that only those who are worthy enter the holy temples. So if that interpretation is correct, then Jesus Christ and the three apostles at the center of this picture are the four cherubim beasts referred to in this photo. I believe that this part of Revelation 19 just took place. The last part of the chap chapter shows that more tribulations are to come. But prior to that, um, we know that Christ will come and take the bride or the church, the 144,000 or the guests to the wedding feast. So again, this is not referring to his official second coming in the clouds because of the rest of Revelation that needs to take place, but one of his prior visits. So did the Rome temple open the portal to allow the ancient 12 to return? And are they now on the earth helping with some of the preparations and building the kingdom? President Nelson said after the dedication that we just experienced a hinge point 
in the church. Hinges are doors, doors are portals, and portals are temples. So I think we need to really think about that and consider it, and also that this dedication was a sign or the event that the Lord is coming, or soon will be coming, for the 144,000 for the bride, for the church, for the portion of the church that's ready to go to the wedding feast. And you can compare that with the story of the 10 virgins and five were ready and five were not. Peter and Paul are mentioned in the Rome dedicatory prayer. Look closely at this reflection and consider Peter and Paul in this revelation scripture. Now I know this scripture is referring to Jerusalem, but what if it's also referring to, to Rome? Revelation 11.4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So I wonder if there's a parallel here. Revelation 11.1 1 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall be tread underfoot, 40 and two months. So in this picture, you see you have two palm trees. So they could be representative of the two olive trees or the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Notice that Christ's palms are in front of the two palm trees. Palms are also mentioned in Revelation 11.1 1, and they were used as a measurement to build a temple or a building. Palm fronds were carried by martyrs. Peter and Paul are both mentioned in the dedicatory prayer and they were martyrs. So I'm just wondering, personal speculation here, but could this temple be Peter and Paul's stewardship? Here's another talk that has a number in it that takes us to that mid-tribulation point. Elder Bednar's Christmas devotional talk in 2015. If you haven't watched it, uh, go watch it. It's, it's wonderful. He says, I invite you to visualize yourself in these events and not merely listen to the words. I pray the Holy Ghost will help you liken these scriptures to you and your family. Samuel the Lamanite came among the people to preach repentance and prophesy of Christ. Now please try to imagine that you are a member of the multitude listening to a prophet of God foretell future events. Do you think he was talking about himself? Was he saying, listen to me, I'm giving you a clue. Samuel declared, behold, I give unto you a sign for five years more cometh. And behold, then cometh the son of God to redeem all those who shall believe on his name. End quote. So again, five years from this talk puts us in early 2021 or about the mid-tribulation point and at the end of the half hour of silence time frame and just right, you know, where, right where we need, right between the two eclipses, etc. December 21st, 2020. Jupiter and Saturn will converge and Jupiter and Saturn were two of the three stars that were thought to have formed the star of Bethlehem. This sign is five years after Elder Bednar's Christmas devotional talk. Jupiter is also known as the King Planet and was part of the Revelation 12 Woman in the Sky alignment of September 23, 2017. And Saturn is known as the Planet of the Harvest and its sign is a sickle. Revelation 14, 17 says, and another angel came out of the temple. So there's a temple, a temple reference again, which is in heaven, he having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle. Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great, the great winepress of the wrath of God. We're going to, in the next 
the last uh, video of this series, we're going to talk about grapes and the harvest pattern. But the question I'm asking is, is this convergence of Jupiter and Saturn the sign that the grape harvest portion is ending? And if so, again, this December 21st puts us close to the halfway point of the tribulations and pretty close to the ending of the half hour of silence. Thank you for listening. This is the end of the third part. And there is one part left, one video left on Daniel and Revelation. And so some of the best is yet to come. We've had a lot of exciting things happen this last month, this uh, March and April of 2020. So you're going to want to make sure you check out the last video. So I'll see you there. Welcome to the fourth and final part of the Daniel and Revelation video collection. I am Jody Stoddard, and these are insights from the perspective of a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you missed the first three, you need to go watch those first because we are creating a giant puzzle with a lot of different pieces. And if you don't have the pieces from the previous three videos, then you aren't going to understand what's going on. So it'll be a lot more meaningful for you if you go and watch those first. But welcome back, and I hope that you gain new insight and enjoy the video. Thank you. At the end of the last video, video number three, we had talked about wheat harvest and we had also mentioned grape harvest. So we need to talk now about the pattern of the harvest. And this is an essay that was put together by Bob Canning. And I am grateful that he said that I could use this. Um, it's amazing. So this helps us understand the actual pattern of the harvest, the harvest cycles and seasons in Jerusalem. The church seems to have been following the Jewish harvest pattern to date. From Joseph Smith to Brigham Young, we have the barley harvest. Barley is the first fruit characterized as weak, susceptible to damage from spring frosts, just like the early church was susceptible to damage as Joseph restored it. With Brigham Young, we entered the wheat harvest. This is the majority of the growing season for the church. It lasts the longest and finishes up at the beginning of the grape harvest with the wheat offering in the temple. And remember, we talked about the wheat offering that was made on the new altar of the Jews in December of last year, uh, December 2018. There were some pretty significant timing with the wheat offering and what just happened in the last April conference of 2019 as well. But the wheat and the tares grow together. The majority of the growth of the church happens during this time, and so do the secret combinations. When President Thomas S. Monson changed the missionary age, we entered the hastening of the work, or the hastened harvest. This is where the wheat is being laid up in store by some workers, and all of the workers are waiting for the Lord of the vineyard to come and tell them it's time to harvest the grapes. This was called the hastened harvest because it had to happen fast or the grapes would turn. We're nearing the end of this phase by his estimation and the hastened harvest is winding down. And he wrote this in September of 2018. When the hastened grape harvest comes to an end, it was also about time for the wheat offering in the temple. So you have the wheat offering, the winding up of the grape harvest, and the beginning of the olive harvest all overlapping each other. And this is where he said we were in his estimation. Now, since then, March and April of 2020, I think that we have seen that happen and we'll explain that later. The next harvest, the olive harvest, is about to kick in with a mighty shaking. The earth has already been ramping up. The olive harvest was characterized by shaking the trees to get the olives out. This is the part where the Lord preaches his own sermons shakes the earth or the olive trees and collects the last people who will hear his voice. The trees are violently shaken to get the olives to fall so they can be gathered. All of the members of the church will be gatherers because it will be unsafe to have missionaries serving outside of their homes. This is the tribulation and the cleansing of America. 
The tribulation is also the time where these olives are put under immense pressure to extract the pure olive oil or a pure remnant that will build Zion. In his opinion, President Nelson and the other apostles during the April 2018, 20, 2019 conference put us on notice that we are leaving Egypt or Babylon and that the new law is coming quickly and that the wheat offering has been or is about to be made. The grape harvest is just about over and the olive harvest is ramping up. Why is this important? Because the restructuring and changes that were made at conference 2019 and the ones that are coming in future conferences are to deal with meeting the needs of the members of the church and remaining the remaining people that are to be harvested. This would mean that the day of the Gentiles will be over soon and Ephra, or is now already and Ephraim's responsibility is just about complete. The wheat harvest is ending and the wheat offering will be made to the Lord. Missionary work will take on a new meaning. All members will be gatherers during the tribulation as secret combinations and those who uphold them are destroyed and the remaining olives are harvested. But more importantly, as the olive harvest shaking occurs, the people of the church need to do two things to survive. One, take care of each other. Two, do their family history and temple work so that family on the other side can provide support as well as during the tr very turbulent times. We need every worthy man, woman, and child on both sides of the veil to survive the battle that we are now entering into with Lucifer and his followers. He will be completely unbound and have free reign for a short but intense time. Again, this was written in September of 2018. And since then, much of what he was pointing to in his description of the various harvests have come to pass. And we'll talk about that more toward the end of this video. Something that I hear often is the quote, we know not the day nor the hour. And when taken out of context, that is only a half truth. So we need to stop misusing this quote because as for the season, year, month, and likely even the week, we can know. That is the purpose of signs. And we can know that from scripture. DNC 106.4 says, And again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore, gird up your loins, that ye may be the children of light, and that day shall not overtake you as a thief in the night. Mark 13.28 Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when her branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye, in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the door. 1 Thessalonians 5 But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Elder Bruce R. McConkie added further insight to the meaning of this passage when he said, those who treasure up his word will not be deceived as to the time of that glorious day, nor as to the events that proceed and attend it. The righteous will be able to read the signs of the times. To those in darkness he will come suddenly, unexpectedly as a thief in the night. But to the children of light, who are not of the night, nor of darkness, as Paul expressed it, that day will not overtake them as a thief. They will recognize the signs as certainly as a woman in travail foreknows the approximate time of her child's birth. Again, remember, he will be here multiple times prior to the official second coming. If we are aware of or find out our mission and we're doing what we're supposed to be, we will likely already know he is here preparing the world and his kingdom for his return in his glory. All right, moving forward, we're going to talk about the bridegroom and the bride and what that symbolizes and also the wedding feast and the wedding and um, getting ready for all that stuff and remember the changes that we had in January of 2019 as you go through these as we go through these um, Hebrew traditions so that you can learn more about our own temple experience and how that has changed. Um, anciently, there wasn't always handwritten invitations given out. Instead, they were verbal. And after a guest was invited, they would change their robe 
or the side with a knot or clasp or pin on it to the other shoulder. So those doing the inviting would know that they had already been invited. Also, the removal of shoes was an ancient symbol of an agreement or a covenant. All right, let's learn about some of the Hebrew traditions around gathering for a wedding. From the book, Beloved Bridegroom, Finding Christ in Ancient Jewish Marriage and Family Customs by Donna Burkhalter Nielsen, this is a synopsis mostly taken from chapter four. The book was used as a reference. And I'm not sure who put this together, um, but I thank them for it. And if they want to let me know who it is, I'd be happy to note them in my references. Anciently, when a groom wrote the ketubah, the terms of marriage agreement for his intended bride, and when she accepted, he gave her a costly gift that had cost him all, a gift that he had earned with his own labor. At that point, the couple entered into an approximate one year long passage where they did not see each other at all. They were considered married and their engagement could only be broken by divorce. During that year, the bride remained in her father's home. She busied herself polishing up her homemaking skills and making her wedding dress, her bridal wardrobe. Perhaps she would make um, a prayer shawl for her husband and work on her genealogy, just the kind of things that you would do getting ready to be married. She would keep her ketubah near, reading and rereading the promises her beloved had made and knowing what a high price he had paid for her. She would depend upon his faithfulness, knowing he would come for her when all was ready. Had he not given all to claim her hand? She kept a candle burning at her window each night of their separation. So you're thinking about this. The bridegroom is Christ. The bride is the church. So remember those analogies as we go through this. The groom returns to his father's home and begins construction on a room to be added onto his father's home a bridal chamber where he would bring his new wife. The groom did not carry out the construction alone. Usually he had friends help him. No, um, all of it was done under the supervision of his father. After all, his father had a reputation to keep and only the most carefully constructed structure would do. In fact, the marriage could not proceed until the son received approval from his father that all was completed to his father's satisfaction. Only then could he collect his wife, and only then could the wedding celebration proceed. The key to this was the friend of the groom. In most cases, um, it, I look at this maybe as being the prophet, who would bring news back and forth from the church to the groom, or in other words, from the groom to the bridegroom. Sorry, from the groom to the bride. And so this friend went back and forth and telling what the other one was doing, that maybe foundation had been dug and the walls were being raised and the roof was installed. And likewise, he would go to the bride in return with news that she um, was working on her beautiful wedding gown, or perhaps he would bring the groom a loaf of bread she had made. As the time and clues were given by the friend of the groom grew near, the bride would pack all the things she had carefully gathered for their new home pack her clothes, be washed and anointed in readiness for the coming of her beloved bridegroom. Her greatest gift to her future husband was her personal purity and readiness and willingness to grow their own kingdom. Her friends would gather around her in anticipation of the happy event. Finally, the day came and after careful inspection, the father now gives his son approval. The bridal chamber is complete and acceptable in every way in his father's eyes. All the constraints that have kept them apart now fall by the wayside. He can now collect his bride and the wedding can begin. In essence, the father just handed off the baton to his son. For an entire unspecified period of time, both the groom and both the groom and his bride have been accountable to the groom's father. In essence, in approving the wedding chamber, the father is handing the baton off. He is no longer accountable. The son is no longer accountable to his father in how to conduct his new kingdom. He has earned his father's complete trust. All is done. It is done well. Hence, the groom becomes lord and king of his own kingdom. Likewise, the bride comes out from under the stewardship of the father through the stewardship of her future bridegroom to become the queen of this new kingdom. They are no longer children in need of constant supervision. They have learned what they need to know. They are equals before the father, and they together are now poised to become one. Within a few nights time, still to be determined, 
the bridegroom will come. There is much to be done within a very short space of time to prepare the final celebrations. But finally he will come with his friends sounding the shofar in the darkest part of the night to surprise and claim his bride. She will be born on an Epirion litter to her new home. So again, this is not the official second coming. This is a precursor. This is when he comes to take her um, or comes to get the righteous for the wedding feast. Again, remembering the five wise virgins and the five unwise virgins. Since the procession begins late at night, and since the bridegroom walks the streets gathering guests on the way to the bride, it took some time. A messenger would run ahead to warn the people that he was coming. Perhaps he would arrive at 11.55 p.m. Or perhaps he wouldn't arrive until 12.01 a.m., which would be the next day. Thus, they didn't know the day or the hour. The same can be said of a woman that travaileth in labor, symbolism which is frequently used to describe second coming events. A woman may go into labor on a certain morning, but not give birth until the next day. We know the baby is coming, but we don't know the day or the hour. And in these scriptures, again, we can see the bridegroom coming for the bride happens somewhere in the middle. The wedding feast takes place before the official second coming. So if we read these scriptures, let's see what that looks like. DNC 8895. And there shall be silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. And immediately after shall the curtain of heaven be unfolded as a scroll is unfolded after it is rolled up. And the face of the Lord shall be unveiled. So there we have the half hour of silence ending in the middle of the tribulations when the Lord comes. And who does he come for? 96. And the saints that are upon the earth who are alive shall be quickened, translated into terrestrial beings, and caught up to meet him. So there again, we have that mid-tribulation event that's going to happen when the Lord will be there and the saints, the 144,000 or whatever saints are ready, will be quickened, translated, and taken up. 97. And they who have slept in their graves shall come forth, for their graves shall be opened, and they also shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. 98. They are Christ, the first fruits, they who shall descend with him first. So here we have reference to the first fruits, the church of the firstborn, those who shall come with him in the clouds when he descends in his glory. So this is not the time when he descends in his glory. This is a previous event. So let's talk about the spiritual symbolism of veils. And Heather Farrell has a link, and I put that at the end in the references. She does a, a really beautiful article on the symbolism of veils. So I'm taking a few words from her article. The practice of women wearing veils is found repeatedly throughout the scriptures, and for a good portion of human history, it has been common for women, and sometimes men, to veil their heads and faces. Today, in many religions around the world, not just Islam, women still cover their heads and faces when they are in the presence of people not of their family and or during religious ceremonies and practices. It is a tradition steeped in powerful religious symbolism and one which Satan has done a good job of misconstruing. Today, many people see a veil as an indicator that whatever is being veiled needs to be protected from outside influences because it is weak, unimportant, or should be controlled. For example, there are people in the world who argue that women need to be veiled in order to protect them from men and their lusts. Or in a similar vein, there are people who see veils as a way to keep something secret, hidden, and untouched. Yet the truth is that such interpretations of veils are exactly the opposite from what they really symbolize. The reason you veil something is because it is powerful, and the veil is to protect those outside of it from the power beneath it. In Exodus 34, we read how Moses came down from the mountain after speaking face to face with God, and his, his face shone so brightly that the children of Israel were afraid to be in his presence. He had to veil his face while talking to them because they could not look upon him. Yet Moses did not veil his face when he talked to God, only when he spoke in front of the congregation. Verse 33 and 34 says, And Moses had done speaking with the children of Israel, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. 
and he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. So Moses wore the veil when speaking to the children of Israel after having spoken to the Lord, but he did not veil himself when he was speaking to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 also explains that one of the reasons Moses veiled his face in the front of the children of Israel, but not before God, was because Israel was not yet ready for the power and knowledge that Moses possessed, but that when Israel shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. 2 Corinthians 3, 13 through 14 says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Doctrine and Covenants 101 says that God himself wears a veil. Verse 22, Behold, it is my will that all they who call on my name and worship me according to mine everlasting gospel should gather together and stand in holy places and prepare for the revelation which is to come when the veil of the covering of my temple in my tabernacle which hideth the earth shall be taken off and all flesh shall see me together so the veil which we often think of as being over the earth is actually over god God is the one being veiled because the earth is not yet ready for the knowledge and power he possesses. Also note that a woman unveils her face at a wedding ceremony to show that, he, that she has accepted all that the bridegroom has prepared for her and that she trusts him and is ready to give herself to him completely. So again, I hope that you could see some of the symbolism in our temple from the year 2019 and apply that. So that was all the information that I shared at the, 20, the February 2020 fireside. And since then, a lot has happened, especially in the month of March. So I wanted to add some slides here at the end in addition to what my original fireside had been. There's a prophecy that the missionaries would be called home and the Lord would preach his own sermons. Brigham Young said, do you think there is a calamity abroad now among the people? Not much. All we have yet heard and all that we have experienced is scarcely a preface to the sermon that is going to be preached. When the testimony of the elders ceases to be given and the Lord says to them, come home, I will now preach my own sermons to the nations of the earth. All you now know can scarcely be called a preface to the sermon that will be preached with fire and sword, tempest, earthquake, hail, rain, thunders, and lightning and fearful destruction. What matters the destruction of a few railway cars? You will hear of magnificent cities now idolized by people sinking into the earth, entombing the inhabitants. The sea will have heave itself beyond its bounds, engulfing mighty cities. Famine will spread over the nations, and nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and state against state, in our own country and in foreign lands. That was Brigham Young from the Journal of Discourses, Volume 8. President Heber C. Kimball said, The judgments of God will be poured out upon the wicked to the extent that our elders from far and near will be called home. Or in other words, the gospel will be taken from the Gentile and later on will be carried to the Jews. Orson Pratt, When God has called out the righteous, when the warning voice has been sufficiently proclaimed among the Gentile nations, and the Lord says, It is enough, he will say to his servants, O ye my servants, come home, come out from the midst of these Gentile nations, where you have labored and borne testimony for so long a period. Come out from among them, for they are not worthy. They do not receive the message that I have sent forth. They do not repent of their sins. Come out from their midst. Their times are fulfilled. Seal up the testimony among them and bind up the law. Orson Pratt, Journal of Discourses, Volume 18. So in March, we have seen our missionaries called home. I don't know if that's permanent or if they will go out again before the tribulations begin in earnest. Already we know that foreign missionaries will stay in their native countries and will no longer go out from there. 
And as far as Canadian and U.S. missionaries go, they may still be called on foreign missions as of the first week of April. But whether or not that will hold will depend on what the future brings. Daniel prophesied that the temples would close, as does a verse in Revelation. Daniel 12, 11, And from the time that the daily sacrifice, or temple worship, shall be taken away, and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. The abomination that make it desolate would be that three and a half years, or the great tribulations. Something happened in June of 2018 that caused me to believe it might qualify as the setup time. When adding 1290 days or three and a half years, we come to the end of 2018. But the temples didn't close then. Instead, there were some wonderful changes. Symbolically, we left the Aaronic robes and the telestial world and we went straight to the Melchizedek robes and the terrestrial millennial world. I believe this symbolized the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, had come for the bride or the church. But weren't the temples supposed to close at the end of 2018 if those dates were right? Well, there is another scripture we need to look at and add in here. Daniel 9.27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one year, and in the midst of the year he shall cause the sacrifice and ablation, or temple worship, to cease. So the covenant was confirmed for a year. Our temple changes beginning of 2019 through the end of 2019 and then starting with the Salt Lake Temple and other pioneer temples in December of 2019 a year after the covenant was confirmed the temples began to close soon because of COVID-19 a cascading closure of temples happened until March 25th it was announced that on March 26th the temples would not open and that they would be completely closed for all ordinances living and proxy Daniel 927 continues and for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Is that a sign that we are moving from the time of troubles to the day of Jehovah? So are we moving from the first half of the seven years of tribulation to the second half? Some say that March 26, 1820, was the actual date of the first vision based on weather reports for that year. If so, then exactly 200 years to the day after the first vision, the temples closed, just as Daniel prophesied. The date was also exactly 400 years from the Mayflower landing at Plymouth Rock, those people who were seeking religious freedom. Not a coincidence. Have the doors to the wedding feast just symbolically closed? And if so, how long until the wedding begins? Another event that happened was Utah had an earthquake and Moroni's trumpet fell. On March 18, 2020, Utah had a quake which dislodged the trumpet from Moroni's hand. Amos 3.14 says that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel, remember we are Israel, upon him I will also visit the altars of Bethel, which is a holy place, and the horns or trumpet of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. It's also noteworthy that all the spires from the Salt Lake Temple, which is under remodeling and reconstruction, are being removed. In Amos verse 6 we read, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? A lot of people just think this is a coincidence and even laughed at it, but I don't think so. The header of the chapter for Amos says, because Israel rejects the prophets and follows evil, the nation is overwhelmed by an adversary. So here we are, with our temples closed, the day of the Gentile ending, the trumpet is no longer sounding to them as the missionaries have been called home, and God warned it would begin in his house. During the April 2020 General Conference, we did the Hosanna Shout. Was this a prophetic event? Revelation 8 1 says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. So this is where we are right now. We are nearing the end of the about half an hour or 20 to 21 years of silence. 
Verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So as we finish reading these next few verses, again, consider, is this a solemn assembly that we had on Sunday, April 5th? Verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So President Nelson, think of his hand as he offered the Hosanna shout. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fires of the altar and cast it into the earth. So the fire and the ash from the sacrifices and offerings represent a plea for the repentance from sin. And if you go back and listen to the choir saying the Hosanna Anthem and the Spirit of God like a fire is burning and understand the ancient temple rites and what they did in the temple, then I think literally what we are seeing here is a Hosanna shout. And then after that shout, the seven angels, which had the seven trumps, prepared themselves to sound. Now we need to find out what those seven trumps represent. If the Hosanna shout of April 5th, 2020 represented Revelations 8, 2 through 5, we shall know soon enough as we see the seven plagues of the seven angels poured out from the rest of Revelation 8 and 9. Many scholars believe that these prophecies of the seven angels in Revelation 8 and 9 are the same as from Revelation 15 and 16, as the descriptions of what is to be poured out is almost identical, and I tend to agree. And if that's so, Revelation 15, 8 says, And the temple was filled with smoke, the prayers from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. If the temples temporarily reopen, then this scripture will happen after they close a second time. But we can tell now the temples are closed. So either we are entering the seven angel time period where those plagues and disasters will be poured out, or we will have a reprieve where the temples will open temporarily. But we know from both Daniel and Revelation that the temples will close during the worst of the tribulations. So it's going to be a wait and see what happens next. But if you want to study up and read on what those plagues and tribulations are from Revelation 8, 9 and 15, 16, then as they start to happen, you will know because you'll know what to be looking for. And then Isaiah 13 mirrors Revelation 8. So it sounds again here like this is also describing a Hosanna shout. So Isaiah 13, 2. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand. So wave the palms. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdom of the nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. So again, is that describing the Hosanna shout? And then when you go on in Isaiah 13, it goes on and describes the plagues and turmoil that will happen in the Great Tribulations, just as Revelation 8 and 9 do. So are we the hosts that the Lord just mustered as the hosts of the battle? Are we moving into the Great Tribulations? Remember earlier when we talked about Ezra Taft Benson's talk and he said that those in attendance in April of 1981, 40 years ago, were those who would usher in the second coming. Now here's Ronald A. Rasband, April 2020 conference, 
he has a comment here and then he quotes President Nelson. We are the people tasked with ushering in the Lord's second coming. President Russell M. Nelson has called this the greatest cause and the greatest work in the Lord's kingdom today. And I want to add my voice to that. I believe that we are here. And I hope that this does not bring you the kind of fear that will immobilize you, but instead the fear of the trust in the Lord and that will put you, that will mobilize you, but with the fear that's the type, that's a respect, that type of fear. So a respect for the Lord in moving forward and preparing and finding out what it is you're supposed to do. What's your mission? Look at the incredible promises that President Nelson gave us in the talk that we went over with the scriptures that he talked about and all of those wondrous things that the people of the winding up scenes have the opportunity to be a part of. So we need to find out what our mission is and be ready to move forward as the Lord directs. Thank you for spending your time with me. I'm grateful that you listened. My biggest prayer is that it helps you move forward in faith and peace and excitement because Jesus is coming back. And I say these things in Jesus name. Amen. Here are the resources and links from the all four parts of this video series. If you have any questions or if there's some that you don't see here that you wanted, just let me know. Thank you. Blessings to you and your family.